Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Contingency Plan Podcast. My name is Jedi Master David, and with me, as always, is Darth Austin. Hello, everyone. Oh, man. Dave Filoni in the sky. All praise be to Dave. Dave Filoni. He... The Dave. He delivered big time. Man, it it feels like it's uh, already Christmas. (laughs) After getting that, I mean, oh yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> yes, Mandalorian, and it was hitting microphones. It's great. <laughs> Mandalorian season two, Head, <laughs> episode five, chapter thirteen. What's it called? I don't know. Oh my god! Because I have to look it up. The Jedi. <laughs> the Jedi. Yeah. What a, you know, we, we have, um, we've speculated a lot over the show, but for this, sh- for this <laughs> to just be so just in your face here, here's what you want is, is quite frankly, very amazing. And, and we're going to obviously go through this and there's a lot of speculation, but I figure we'll, uh, we'll just go ahead and start her off with a good old, how's your week going? Did you enjoy Thanksgiving? Still in my coma, toast state right now. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Everything's happening around me, and I'm just not paying attention. I'm just laying in bed. Yeah, just all day, every day. Yeah. No, it was a good week. I uh, I came down with a little cold Monday, and just because of paranoia and everything, I ended up getting the entire week off. So. Got a nice little vacation in. Got to enjoy a little relaxation. Got myself a new Xbox game and put a little more time into the Switch. So Xbox, good times. Good times. right? Which coincidentally will probably be uh, again Star Wars related. I know. Uh, <laughs> probably be the last game I get for the Xbox. Start saving up for the PlayStation Five. I'm just tired of Xbox. Hey, yeah. And I mean, there. I don't know. I don't know if if I'm if I'm gonna go for another generation of console. I I just don't play. Well, you it probably enough. don't have a reason to for at least a year or two because there's really no. There's nothing that you can't get on the PS4 right now. So right, but I mean, even <laughs> with be a that, five hundred bucks for you. Yeah, but even with that, I don't really play much. I've thought about it, like because we were talking yeah. about the, the Spyro remaster, and I never finished that. I was like, a couple days, I was like, ah, I'm gonna sit down and then like, uh, you know, maybe go through a little bit of that, and I didn't. I just didn't. I came up with other things to do. So I don't know. I don't. And I don't you know. certainly have had some free time with, you know, COVID this year. So yeah. if you weren't gonna do it this year, it's probably just not gonna happen. Yeah, I've I've filled my free time though with other projects and stuff. So yeah, I I don't know, man. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's going to be, um, if it's going to be something that really tickles my interest anytime soon. But yeah, I mean, if you get a price drop and yeah, <sighs> maybe. <laughs> well, if you're willing to go all if you're willing to go all digital, you can get a good deal on it. But I don't think either of us really no. have any interest in that. No, I think we're both still the generation where we appreciate actually having the physical copy of the game. And now Switch is a different story because yeah. I've had a lot of um, digital downloads on the Switch, uh, so I, I get the I get the allure. But like, I don't know. I, there is something about having the game, and there's the potential that you could get a little money out of that game when you go to sell it. Yeah. Or if you go to yeah. sell it still. Digital, so. you can't do that. <laughs> you can't get it traded no. or yeah, you can't. You know, swap with a friend or anything, let them try it out. That's just going away, unfortunately. Yeah, and I was going to check around because I, I did see somebody post about, um, I guess Squadrons was on sale for like something like below 20 bucks. Uh, I believe last I checked it was around 23 Yeah. Uh, um, on the Black Friday sales for Xbox. PlayStation might be cheaper, though. Yeah, so I, I might look I into that. I thought about it. I, I, I still, certainly did, just for the channel. <laughs> I still don't. I, I still don't know if I care about it enough because it looks repetitive as hell, and 
I don't know. Maybe it if it's if it's cheap, if it's cheapy cheap, then yeah, I, I might just for just for the lulls, you know. <laughs> just for the lulls. Well, eventually it'll be like Battlefront, and it'll be five, ten bucks. So just yeah. wait a little while. EA get, games always drop in price. <laughs> I still get a lot of enjoyment out of Battle Battlefront, though. It's still fun to just run and yeah. gun and stuff. But you know, I of course I really haven't played that in a while either. So I don't know. We'll we'll have to see. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not really interested. And of course, the most important game will be coming out. Of course, the most important game will be coming out early 2021. Pikmin. Yeah. Lego Star Wars. Yeah. The complete saga. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie. I, I Nobody else appreciates Lego Star Wars. <laughs> no, I mean, I could probably be persuaded to buy that. You know, the, the Lego games are, are, you know, simple. And they're made for kids, but they are kind of fun too, and they have their own lore to themselves. Um, I know we've played the Star they Wars, do. we've played, I, you know, the the uh, Lord of the Rings and the Batman's and all that good stuff. So it it's definitely very all encompassing. I, I think if you just want a you know a very simple kind of game with you know kid puzzles and stuff, plenty of then, collectibles and yeah, plenty yeah. of characters to play as. Yeah, I don't think that that's a bad a bad thing, and, and especially for kids. If you got kids, those are those are like an automatic oh, lock. Yeah. I think still they're an automatic lock for a lot of kids. But I can't even do my the question Fortnite is, would it be dances. Good on Switch. <laughs> oh sure, I don't see why not. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't see why not. No, there's been quite a few games that I've I've picked up a few games for Switch that I thought, man, this is so much better on a full size console. But mm-hmm. I think for something like Lego Star Wars, it'd probably be Taylor made for that uh yeah you know for a little portable on the go type of thing and then you you know you can dock it and put it just like your normal stuff so yeah yeah i think it'd be fine and it's not like you're gonna push graphics to the max on lego star wars you know no (laughs) certainly not yeah yeah it's it's not gonna be nearly as nice as like you know breath of the wild so if they can handle that they can handle lego (laughs) Well, God, the the new uh, Zelda game, the uh, what are they calling this one? Hyrule Warriors. Yeah, or? the graphics on that kind of look like crap. I they do, but it wasn't. Everyone keeps comparing it to Dynasty Warriors, and I think that maybe the graphics are the best reason for that because they never really focused on graphics either. Yeah, but I mean, so, like, but Breath just all of- about how many people you can fit on the screen. True, but Breath of the Wild actually looked pretty. And, and granted, you didn't have as many, uh, you know, other assets and stuff like all over the place. But Breath of the Wild looked pretty. It had a great art style. It, you know, it moved pretty yeah. well. It's a fun little game. But yeah, I don't. I don't know. Maybe the engine's just chugging, trying to bring in that many enemies. Because I've seen like waves of enemies, and it's Probably. it's pretty wild. So I. Oh yeah, yeah. You're talking like hundreds on screen. Yeah, maybe just pushing the system to its limits. Um, so I guess that makes sense, but... We just need an Ocarina of Time remake next. Nintendo doesn't listen to their fans, though. No, they do not. Because even with the Mario, what was it, All-Stars, the thing that came out? Yeah. Those yeah. are ju- those are just like ported emulators. They're not, they're not... They're not what they could be. Like, fans have made better remakes of those games than Nintendo just put out. And yeah, you're right. If you put out yeah. an, uh, like a, like a re I, I would almost just say remake. Don't just do up res remake the game. Make it look, make it look awesome. Uh, an ocarina yeah. of time. Yeah, or, instead of doing definitive editions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Majora's mask. I mean, that was popular for some people, you know, some people didn't like the mechanic of time and you know, all that stuff, but it was an interesting game. And, I yeah. mean, even Mario. I mean, Wind Waker was big for some people. Yeah, I thought Wind Waker did have a uh, re, like a remaster or something like that. Maybe I'm wrong, but that was interesting. And they might have for the Wii U. I don't think they're this sure. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, Mario, their flagship, their flagship Mario brand. I mean, 64 should have been handled put some better. Love into that should have been handled better. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think, I think the thing is Nintendo doesn't really value their, their archive of games as much as Xbox and PlayStation do. I don't, I don't so think remakes they... just, 
I don't think they care about remakes. I don't think they care about anything. I mean, like a lot of the stuff that they seem to be putting out now is just this oo anime crap. I mean, I don't care There's about that. I don't care about that. It's like I understand where you're based out of, but there's still a huge American audience that really just they just want you to to produce good games and and give us the the bit of nostalgia because you're not really coming out with new interesting games. It's all like uh, another Zelda, another Mario, another another Pokemon, yeah. another yeah, which is fine, but just do them well. And if you're yeah. going to remaster stuff, actually do that. You know? <laughs> Don't give us the emulator that yeah, I had back in 2005. <laughs> right. Yeah. Anyway, this isn't a Nintendo podcast. I think we probably should move on to Star Wars. <laughs> so we talked uh, about it a little bit. Lego Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. true. <laughs> so again, season two, episode five, chapter thirteen. Um wow. Spoilers ahead. Uh, you know, if you haven't watched the episode, do. Written and directed by Dave Filoni. And we said on last week's episode that if Ahsoka Tano doesn't show up now, she won't. This is the perfect Yeah. The perfect had to be Dave. instance. Had to be Dave. And guess what? Right out of the gate, man. Yeah. Ahsoka Tano. <laughs> Very oh. well done, which I think is the thing we worried up about the most. We worried about that. So much. How are they going yeah. to? Was it just going to be a non-combat role? Oh no, no. We're getting oh. we're getting Ahsoka doing all the Jedi stuff here. We've got force jumps. We've got force abilities. We've got lightsaber combat. We've got utter destruction of these guard people. A giant bell ringing, lightsabers turning on and off, blaster fire. We've got everything in this episode that honestly makes it so special you almost can forgive ahsoka essentially maybe not coming back in this yeah. series but that's and a i don't bit... think she will truthfully i think that it was set up perfectly for her to be a one and done which a lot of people won't like but what i will say is we are still focusing on mando like we should yeah we're, I... not, we're not overshadowing him i mean they they mixed very well together. I didn't feel like it was an all Ahsoka episode. Mm-hmm. It wasn't an all Baby Yoda episode. Mando still mattered. The, so. Yeah, th- this was this was done very well from start to finish. But let, let's just start at the beginning. So again, we have um, kind of like a fortification here, and Ahsoka is essentially assaulting the fort. <laughs> One man wrecking Did that crew. Force- did that forest scene almost seem a little bit like the start of Rise of Skywalker? Just slightly. <laughs> Same amount of carnage, I felt like, with all the uh, the cult members that Kylo was going after. Yeah, kind of, yeah. I, I you know, I did like... The, well, okay, so previously we had, we had said where Ahsoka was going to be found, and, you know, Bo had sort of alluded to, like, a forest planet. Well, this was a forest planet, but it's clearly been called pretty bad. Um, there's a lot of fog down trees. Nothing looks like it's living outside of the fort. Ahsoka is using the fog to kind of go through everything and destroy this entire forest that I, you know, we're assuming was sent to um, stop her, I guess. We get the character of the magistrate and her... And her Literally by name, the gunfighter. You know what I mean? He was identified. Yeah. Oh yeah, so he's got like a gunfighter. And this this episode gave me such a like good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, like the '60s spaghetti mm-hmm. western, all that stuff. You know, Clint Eastwood, all yes. those things that I love so much. It gave me those vibes like throughout, and it was very clear, to, at least to me, that this was the the route that they're going with this. So. What what? Uh, give me a little bit more on you know first seeing Ahsoka calling out the magistrate. The look. What what were, what was your overall on on this beginning scene? Well, it uh, <coughs> it shocked me a little bit because I figured they would have a different 
reveal for Ahsoka. You know, I thought it'd be more like a, you know, wise old master who doesn't really fight anymore and, you know, just discover hidden out somewhere mm-hmm. instead of just straight up murdering 30 people. <laughs> uh, probably the most aggressive we've ever seen Ahsoka, uh, which I enjoyed quite a bit. Um, you know, it looked realistic, the headdress, everything. They did a very good job there. The the interactions between the magistrate and her were awesome. Uh, I loved how confident and aggressive Ahsoka was talking to her, you know, telling her you have one day left, basically. Yep. Kind of blowing off the, the threats of killing the innocent people. It's like, well, you're going to do that either way, so I'm going to at least take you with them, you know. So, yeah, it was... Uh, it was jarring, but in a very good way. Really appreciated it. Yeah, um, it, it was. It was certainly. It was certainly a bit jarring, just because again they went in so hard on Ahsoka to begin with. Um, I did like her conversation with the with the magistrate uh, Morgan Elsbeth. Elsbeth. Um, she didn't flinch at all. And yeah, the magistrate, you know, sort of like, Oh yeah, well I'll kill like, uh, how much is this information worth? And she's looking for information, by the way, how much is this information worth? One life, two lives, a hundred lives, all that good stuff. And you know, I'll make them suffer. It's like, but they're already suffering. So she's, she's taking a very realistic view of the world where it's like, well, they're already suffering. I can't make you stop. Well, I can make you stop, but for right now, you have a choice. She's still giving the magistrate a choice, but you know, it, it comes down to, I can stop you, but I can't, you know, I, I can't stop you from bre- being cruel, but I will stop you, and I will get this information. So, I thought that was very, very interesting. Um, <laughs> the security forces were severely underwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but the combat, man, the combat is so good. It is so good. Um, you know, dual lightsaber wielding, they're white again. And it just, she just killed it. Rosario Dawson, by the way, which is someone that has been linked to this particular character for a while. It's not like a, a secret. I think that she looked the part and played the part. There are even mannerisms. There is at one point, remember when she was picking up the rock, she didn't just pick it up. She kind of like flipped it and caught it again, you know, and those little tiny things just sort of like brought me back to clone wars and a younger Ahsoka being somewhat playful, but she doesn't have the same like humor anymore that she had in clone Wars. she's grown up she's dealing with bigger things now and right. she's dealing with the hurt and i i saw some comments it's like well you know she wasn't like playful like she was in clone wars it's like but she was she wasn't play- playful at the very end of clone wars right. either though. But, but like she was at the beginning you're thinking right. of young padawan ahsoka yeah. like 14 years old <laughs> but the thing is is we she haven't had she, that for a while she was playful at times but she's gone through much more much more, and, and yeah. this stuff, you can't just she's remain the same forever. She was, you know, she's yeah. changed quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, she's just older. She's grown up, and that's that's not a bad thing. Now, one other thing that I saw some comments on were the length of the Lekus, Um, and I was a little tiny bit surprised at how short they looked. I was, yeah. it, it wasn't a big deal, but it was like, I, for some reason, I envisioned them being slightly longer um, because we've had media where they were longer. Um, but I think that probably had to do with practicality, like combat right, practicality. Right. Again, if it had been Ahsoka where she didn't fight, maybe I could see that, <laughs> but it would be very awkward and unrealistic otherwise. Yeah. But even with that, that headpiece, it, God, it just looks so good. It looks so good. I was, I was blown away. And like I said, I think we both had talked about at times where, no, nah, she's not going to have any combat clear very clear combat and yes. and just like all the all the reservations about how this i mean you know ahsoka has orange skin she's got the white facial markings she's got these lakus you know she's got the headband 
and just to see this live, it's like, it's a complete affirmation that it's totally possible. It's totally possible to bring in characters that look very, very different and make them look good on the real, the real screen. So, and Mandalorian has done a very good job throughout (laughs) the entire series doing that. The, uh, the episode where we break loose the um, Twilic character. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, they they did a very good job with alien species there too, but this has definitely stepped up another level. No it's doubt. Just very well done. And it really brings up the question, now that you've seen live action Ahsoka, how would you feel about seeing more of it? Not in Mando, but on its own. Right. Well, I mean, I think it, it kind of does set up the potential uh, there are so many setups for potential offshoot shows now i mean well what about a bo katan you know mandalorian sort of deal uh what about you know a soka tano spinoff series um and so forth but there, there's more speculating but i i think i think what we should do let's talk through the show and then let's let's speculate at the end because there's too much to speculate for me and i've got stuff written down true, true. so then we we do change to the perspective of the mandalorian and and baby Yoda here, uh, that darn, that darn, uh, console knob. He <laughs> just wants it so much yeah. and he's using the force. He's now again, back yeah. to using some of the force a little bit here, uh, to unscrew the knob and get his, get his little toy. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, they just do this. They just do this little, this little guy really well. I even like when they, when they finally land on the planet He's going down the ramp and he just sort of plops down with his little his little ball toy, you know. <laughs> it's just, it's so, it's yeah. so good. <laughs> it's so good yeah. to me. Um, but Mandalorian does show up on the planet. He, you know, goes into our little fort here, you know. Uh, he doesn't say why he's there. You know, smart, obviously, but you know, he's tracking, been tracking. He's like, oh, you're a hunter, huh? Um, and this obviously brings some interest from the magistrate. Uh, but we, let's go through this town. This is a very interesting town. Again, this whole town, this whole planet just looks dead, but you clearly have, um, kind of like a mercantile village there. There's stands and stuff and whatnot in here. So there's some commerce, I would assume, but little huts and everything. And they don't want to talk to the Mandalorian at all. And even one of them warns him. It's like, don't talk, don't talk to these people. You know, don't talk to me. Um, so that's speaking of him specifically. I know I've seen him in something before, but uh, did you recognize him? No, I, I did. I haven't even really looked up the cast all that you much. Didn't? Okay, gotcha. Uh, it was a small part, but uh, I'll I'll try and look it up as as yeah. we talk to to maybe see. Um, see if there were any major cameos, but the village again, it's, it's, it's still very foggy, but it's, it's an interesting village. It's, it's, it's all like hutted up together and everything. Um, they're yeah. clearly, a, it's actually a very com- compared to the other villages we've seen in Mandalorian. It's a pretty, pretty large one too. I mean, yeah, this is more of a small city than a village almost. Right. Um, and the character of the gunfighter, I guess we just know him as Lang. So that's, um, that's his name, uh, played by Michael. Oh, I don't want to pronounce people's names, uh, <laughs> Bien or something. I don't know. It's B I E H N something okay. like that. Um, he looked awful familiar to me. What has he all been in, in, uh, Oh, he's in the Terminator. He was in the Terminator series. He was in Aliens, The Abyss. Uh, he was in Tombstone. Uh, really? Yeah, I'll be interested to see who he played in Tombstone. I, I got a his face looks so familiar, but I just I had a really hard time placing who he was. And again, I didn't really look up any of these folks beforehand. I probably should have. I mean, this is a real, uh, he was Johnny Ringo. Whoa. Dang. Well, 
it goes back to the old spaghetti western vibe, though. I mean, it's cool that you're getting that kind of cast for this episode. I'm looking at his face. <laughs> like, there's so many pictures of him smiling. It's like, well, John, Johnny Ringo never smiled. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, man, that's wild. We we have both watched and were forced to watch Tombstone many, many times during our childhood. I love it. It's a great, it's yeah. a great movie. But, um, but yeah. Well, wow. there you go. This episode alone might get that into Mandalorian. You never know. Johnny Ringo. We'll have to test that. <laughs> Our magistrate, uh, played by Diana Lee Inosanto, um, prolific martial artist. She was involved in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Blade, Wild Wild West, Star Trek Enterprise, Hulk, Rent, Fast and the Furious, Tokyo Drift. Um, daughter of Dan Inosanto, who was a training partner of Bruce Lee. You know, I when I saw her... Because clearly there was going to be a confrontation between her and Ahsoka. I was wondering, it's like, is she yeah. going to hold up? She holds up. She man. does. She was <laughs> sick. Yes, so, she does. Anyway, she is a martial artist, so now now we know. Um, Makes sense, yeah. Let's see. It looks like the, 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 the man who we were talking about, just prisoner, uh, James Croak. It doesn't look like he has um, much out there. He did. He did. I. I. I agree. For some reason, he does look mildly familiar, but it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like he was um, anyone particular. Hmm. I'm not. I'm not sure. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, getting getting back to the village, uh, we do have some more morbid parts of the village. The uh, little cages yep. that people are held in, the little yeah. sh- jockey shock cages. Yeah, so it's yeah, it's very clear. There's there's torture. There's obviously a lot of suffering. And then when we we open the door to where the magistrate lives, it's like this idyllic kind of like Asian style garden with a little pond, and it's all green. You notice the color change there. That was such a yeah. cool color change. Like yeah. the 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 eye for color and and like the foreboding of of the village and then the open like beauty of the inner sanctum, so to speak, was was very very cool. I thought that that was excuse me hiccuping was very very well done. I agree because it, it's just such a change. Because like even the sky outside of this fort is different, but when you go in here, it's like it's the last remnant. <laughs> Of the planet, so to speak, life, the last yeah, of life last on the life. planet. Yeah. So our magistrate uh, offers the Mandalorian a, a basically proposition. She has a full Beskar spear that she offers to him as payment for taking out a Jedi, and I looked up. Beskar spear because I'm a master Googler Uh and apparently there is a traditional Mandalorian hunting spear uh, that they had used and this is like one of those weird pronunciations that I I don't even think I can attempt but it looks like like bevy ragir or something like that Um, so I don't know if that's specifically trying to hearken back to like a a Mandalorian spear or this is just the magistrate's preferred weapon and she melted down Beskar for it. Um, but there is a Mandalorian spear out there and, you know, she kind of hands it off to him and like he's testing it and everything and gets the ping on the armor. Uh, so that, that's a hefty price, man. That would have to be a little tempting for a Mandalorian, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Considering what he's done in the past for just, you know, little cards of Beskar. Yeah. I mean, that could that could go a long way for all the foundlings. <laughs> yes, it would fund many foundlings. <laughs> I mean, or, you or get... he could just keep it when he finally gets his basilisk. He could be riding on it, holding a spear. <laughs> there you go. Melt it down and make a little <laughs> little mini suit of armor for for the for baby Yoda there. That'd be sweet. <laughs> I'm there telling you, you, I want to see a little Mandalorian Yoda creature. I think that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, moving on, we do get the Mandalorian attempting to track Ahsoka. Uh, 
she kind of sneaks up on him. And here's something interesting yeah. from this scene because she attacks, obviously, and he defends himself with his armor. So we do see yeah. that, you know, the armor is, we're, you know, we're, we're doubling down that this is resistant to lightsaber attack. Um, I don't know. And it just kind of goes back to, it, it harkens upon, you know, how these were able to be one of the biggest enemies of the Jedi back in the day right. because they actually could stand up against them unlike everybody else in the galaxy that had no defense against them. Yeah, absolutely. And he pulls out his tricks, his trusty flamethrower. Um, yeah. And the it, grappling it, hook scene was kind of entertaining. That made me laugh <laughs> because, again, there's some of the playfulness. Ahsoka, she's you know, tied up, but then she smiles and then jumps over a tree and you know gets uh-huh. out of it. it but there, there's the playfulness. You just got to look for it. Um, even when she, when she drops down and she's got her hands behind her back, her sabers behind her back, and opens them up in like an X pattern. Again, it's like it's very reminiscent of stuff that was in clone wars. It's like, this is Dave yes. Filoni making the details, making yeah. the connections, you know? Well, kind of jumping ahead a little bit, and I don't want to talk about too much because it's a really good scene, but uh, there is the part where he's, where she's hunting all of the guards and she actually, it's almost like a horror movie scene. She opens up the sabers <laughs> yeah. like she used to in clone wars. And I, I, I nerded it out a little bit there. That was pretty epic. <laughs> yeah. no, no doubt. That was very, very cool. Um, Mando does stop her finally. It's like, Ahsoka Tano, Bo-Katan sent me. And, uh, you know, without even really asking anything about him, it's like, I, you know, I'm here to, you know, the, whatever he said. I don't remember exactly what he said. I, you I'm here know. to talk to you about something. And she's like, well, I hope it's about him. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I and I thought that was cool. You know, she, she clearly, you know, can see little Yoda just on a rock. Um, <laughs> just staring Watching at the fight him. as always. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great. Um, I don't know. It, it has to be cool for her to see another one of Yoda's, like the species of Yoda, because, you know, she, she knew Yoda, she knew him well. Yeah. And then she and gets get a reference to that. Right. And then she gets to commune here a little bit with Mando pacing in the background, you know, looking yeah. at him periodically, but there she's dad, right. <laughs> but she's able to communicate with him on like an emotional level. You know, maybe the language isn't quite there, but she is able to communicate with him a lot, was able to get quite a bit yeah. out of him, and we get a name. So we have to stop calling Ew. it the child or baby Yoda. It has a name. Which will never be used other than by us nerds, but that's fine. <laughs> so it's Grogu. Grogu is its name. Yeah. And, I, and I thought it was funny, like whenever Mando would say Grogu, it was like, huh? Just like look at him like a happy dog. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> yeah. you know my name. <laughs> yeah. And we even get, which I think is a lot cooler, uh, we get an origin story. For little Grogu, you know, we know where he was during the Clone Wars and whatnot. We need to talk uh, about this. It, it, it kind of it, probably it does nauseum. bring up some issues, but still interesting. Does it though? We let's let's just pause and let's go over this because I think it's very important. Grogu was trained by masters, plural, on Coruscant. He was taken from the Jedi Temple at Coruscant. And he has also suppressed his powers to avoid detection. So there is a sentience here that we is above a baby. Yes. Okay. So this is not like a baby, baby. He's learned. He's had some training. Can't speak in our speech, but there's obvious communication here. He knows what's going on. So who trained him? Where did he come from? And who took him away from the temple? Those are the three the three big questions. And I'm going to go ahead and say that I think that probably Yoda himself and Windu probably the one were the ones to train him, uh, just because of how important the role of training him would be. Well, I mean, let's get more granular, okay? Is this Yoda's child? Or is it Yaddle's child? Potential. Or is it Yoda, is it Yoda and, Yaddle's and Yaddle's child? Yaddle's child. <laughs> well, 
we have potential for that now, and we don't have anyone else in the species. But that boy, we know of. The ramifications of that. <laughs> if this is the child of Yoda, what, what a story we could tell. What if we had a Yoda Force ghost in The Mandalorian? Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Calling it my son. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, Yoda is still a part of the old ways where Jedi leave behind the attachments. They don't have kids. They find Force-sensitive children. But what if their species was in trouble? What if they, you know, Yoda and Yaddle were the last of the species? Mm-hmm. What if by necessity they didn't want their species to die out? So they had a kid. Or was this someone, uh, you know, a child that they found or one of them found? And, you know, because it's of their species, they had to train it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, it's deep. But then again, so next question, who trained him? I mean, come on. Yoda tr- clearly had some hand in this, or at least Obviously. Yoda Yaddle. Mace had to have known about it. Had to have known about oh, it. Oh, yeah. Being how, you know, Yoda trained Mace directly and he was his strongest student, I'd be very surprised if he wouldn't entrust him with training one of his own species. So I think there's a very good chance of that. And it would also kind of lean towards why Mace didn't believe that Anakin was the chosen one because we already know that Yoda's species is extremely, extremely in tune with the Force, very strong with the Force. Mm-hmm. So it wouldn't be far-fetched for them to think that he could have potentially been the chosen one based on what his midichlorian count was, obviously, at the time. I don't believe that Yoda... I think we don't know yet. I don't believe that Mace believed in the chosen one. I don't think he believed he probably didn't. in it at all. So I don't think it, I don't think that was even a thing. I just, I just don't think he believed that the, the chosen one, the prophecy, was actually something to give credence to. But how many of the council members knew? Do you think Obi Wan knew? I don't think Obi Wan knew. I think that this was a secret. I think so too. And then I start going through the council. It's like who else oh. on the council do you think would have known? Uh. <laughs> It, it just kind of gave me a happy thought, though. What if after this they retcon it into the original trilogy and now we have little CGI Baby Yoda added to the training sessions with the battle he, he He hides in under... In the background eating a frog. He, he, he hides <laughs> under Liam's dead body as Anakin slaying all the younglings or something morbid like that. <sighs> Gosh, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think I think it was far more secluded than that. I don't think he was even in in with mixed in with the rest of the younglings. I think he was very. I feel like he's probably very isolated. It was probably a very small circle that knew of his existence. I would probably say Yoda Mace, maybe the librarian. Mm. Um, I don't even know who else he would trust. Truthfully. <sighs> yeah. There's so much potential for that, though. So much potential, and it—it's funny because you know George never really wanted to, you know, talk about Yoda's species or expand upon it. Mm-hmm. It's just interesting how we're getting this much now, and how it all ends up tying back to Yoda in this way. Sure. And when you think about it, it could also open up a potential storyline in um, the High Republic, depending on how far in to the, you know, uh, the movies we go, how close to the movies we go, I should say. Well, again, again, it's, it's too, it's too, it's too far back. It's too far back. It's already been established. We we just don't know how far back it's going to go. Well, it's 200 years. We we've already established. I mean, I know that they, I know that originally started like 400, but you know, it, it, they're not they're not going to touch High Republic with the movies, and Baby Yoda wouldn't have, or Grogu, excuse me, Grogu was not born during the High Republic era. He's only fifty, so 
that we I don't I doubt I think we'll probably hear of Yoda in the High Republic, but aside from that, I think I think that that's it. Um, now one other interesting thing here is then who took who took Grogu away from the temple, and for me. Uh, it could it could be very underwhelming, but I think that there's one of two choices. And, well, actually, I think there's three. I think you can presumably say potentially Yaddle, and Yaddle died saving the child. Yoda, and Yoda never spoke of it, but realized that it couldn't, you know, the two of them couldn't be in the same place at the same time because of, you know, their connection with the Force, and maybe that would alert somebody. Or three, Mace Windu survived his fall and wanted to, you know, do continue to do the right thing and then smuggled Baby Yoda away. Dang it, Grogu. Grogu away. Um, but then <laughs> but then if that's true, what happened to Mace? If is he, you know, if he survived the fall with no hands. True. Well, there's potential to bring Mace back. I don't know if I don't know if we really want that. I don't. Um, Not in the shape but, he was in. No. I, there's always been a part of me that would be interested to see what Mace would have devolved into to survive in this situation after the injuries he sustained and the trauma he went through, the betrayal and everything. Uh, there's always potential it could have finally pushed him completely over to the dark side or it could have strengthened his resolve. Well, that, so it would give him a reason to show back up saving baby Yoda, but Grogu. Uh, Grogu. Well, and the, see, <laughs> see, that's the thing though. It's like, you know, with his, with his fighting, with his fighting form, you know, with his fighting form kind of drawing the way it did, you know, there was always a potential that Mace, you know, potentially could be susceptible to the dark side's influence, but he was, you know, he's a strong Jedi. So I don't know. I, I, I personally think I lean a little bit more towards the Yaddle thing and, uh, you, you know, Yaddle potentially would too. being killed. And I, th- I feel like we might eventually get a flashback once Grogu starts to unsuppress the memories of the time after the temple. So, yeah. And that's another thing who taught him how to, you know, shut himself off from the force. Mm -hmm. Is it something he just knew to do himself or did Yaddle potentially teach him that? Uh, Did Yaddle abandon him? Did Yaddle cut herself off from the force so they wouldn't be detected together? What, what all could have happened there. Sure. Yeah, I think that there's still a lot more to explore. Um, but, uh, you know, again, kind of back to the episode, I did like the interaction that we had here. And Ahsoka sort of forming a bit of a bit of a bond. But we have her reluctance to train the child. Because she senses much fear. And she knows what that fear can turn into with Anakin. Even to the best of the best, the best is of what us. she refers to, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of folks who come into this series very casually won't understand that as much. But for those who watch Clone Wars, Rebels, uh, you know, the movies and all that good stuff you'll understand exactly why she's reluctant. She's reluctant to uh, yeah. train the child. And also she, yeah, forsa- old- she, she, she forsake the uh, Jedi Order too. She's not a Jedi. Yeah. Well, and speaking to that, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> she's referred to as the Dredi- Jedi two or three times in this. Yeah. And never actually makes any comments about it, which is odd because in the clone wars, she would have been quick to say, I'm no Jedi. Yeah. I actually thought she doesn't say that here. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit. It makes you wonder what's happened between rebels in this time period. Maybe it just doesn't matter as much to her anymore, but 
Uh, yeah, I, I half expected her to say, I am no Jedi. Let's talk a little <laughs> bit about the training. Yep. Well, the, the, the test uh, with the stone. So Ahsoka yep. floats a stone. Grogu catches it, but doesn't want to doesn't want to send it back. And Ahsoka enlists Mando to kind of help with this, and he realizes that hey, maybe if it has his little ball toy, he'll do it, and he does real quick. Give me that ball, I need it. Yeah. So she, you know, she has the assurance that he is indeed, you know, the force sensitive that she believes, and you know, he, he has some power left, and he can do this. And I thought it was really cute how she comes up and like holds his little hand. I know. Yeah. <laughs> she does that a few times. I thought that was. I thought that was really. That was really cute. Um, but again, she's yeah. she's very reluctant and to still to train. Uh, she says, you know, she he should just let the his powers fade. Just let him fade. Yeah. But Mando, uh, M- Mando makes, I think the argument that a lot of folks who aren't force sensitive would make, you know, the fear it's, it's like, well, you know, if it's fear that all the better reason to train him on how to deal with it. But Ahsoka is in a way still of the older school thought process where it's like, no, you can't train around fear. It'll just lead to what I already know happened to the best of us type of deal. Um, right. So I, I don't know. It, it, it definitely, it definitely is a bit of a clash. You know, Mando's not really going to understand what she went through, what the Jedi went through. But I think, I think and that there a lot had, of the audience isn't going to understand that either. You kind of harken some. back to that. But I will say that, you know, it, it's always been kind of a, a a sticking point for me where we, we conquer fear all the time. You know, we have, you know, fear of, you know, rejection, fear of, you know, messing up or, you know, whatever, breaking something. But we but we can master that. We can conquer that. And it, and it comes down to the basic argument of the force. Is the dark side so much more powerful that even if you have some doubt, some fear will automatically overtake you? Or, you know, is it just a, a fact that Anakin was weak? He was strong in the force, weak in the mind. Yeah. And that if they would have helped build his mind and, and build his confidence from childhood at well, the same time, <laughs> right? He had, he had a lot of things going against him, but like there are other Sith that didn't have that much going against, even like Darth Maul, Darth Maul probably would have been okay being a Jedi if they would have found him, but they never found him. And that was something that he was always so angry about that the Jedi never found him. And he could have, he could have had a completely right. different path. He could have been, you know, Jedi Knight Maul. You know what I he mean? He could have been trained by Yoda. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah, or anyone really. But so, I don't know. There, there's, there, the Force is still so mysterious. And, and it just makes you think, because I can overcome fear, but a Jedi who has fear in their heart can't. I don't know. I don't necessarily think I believe that still. Um, I, and- I've always personally believed, in, and it's a very ironic that it's the fear of the dark side that makes the Jedi think that. Right. It's their own ignorance towards the dark side in a way. Yeah. And again, we're we're dealing with with a generation of Jedi who have never dealt with the dark side. You know, Ahsoka is one of the few who have actually gotten to deal with it and survive. <laughs> yeah, well, even with even with Ray, with Ray in the Maul cave and Vader, right? Well, with Ray in the cave and and sort of touching on that dark side, um, you know, she and and this was also something with Luke and I and I actually do think that this is an important thing and it it is a, ph- a philosophical deal. Ray didn't immediately turn to the dark side upon touching it. She just realized it and she realized that there was a path. Um, so, I, and I, and this, uh, this constantly brings in the argument of the gray Jedi and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, are you just going to be taken by the dark side? I don't know. I don't think that that's necessarily the case for everybody. But I do think that these the old the uh, old Republic or the um, prior Republic Jedi really 
they just never taught people how to deal with fear very much. They just said, don't, don't uh, even dabble. Don't look at the dark side. Don't do it. Don't touch it. Don't lick it. Don't put it, you know, anywhere close to you. Just, you know, be, be with the light, you know? So I don't know, man. I mean, maybe that's just a failing of the Jedi, you know, that Jedi code, because we've had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of stuff from like the original Jedi, you know, when, when that was a thing that, and it's very, very different, very, very different lore there. So I don't know. I understand Mando's point. I understand Ahsoka's point. I think it's it's both very difficult uh, and I th- for either side. And I, th- I think also Ahsoka is not well equipped to train <coughs> Grogu because she she comes from a generation of Jedi who have suppressed all feelings. So she doesn't have an ability to relate with him on having these feelings. Whereas, say, Luke, who has embraced in some ways those feelings, you know, uh, love and attachment for his father. He's used dark side abilities like Force Choke before. Uh, he's, he's tapped into the dark side to some extent throughout his life. And he can relate in a way that I don't think Ahsoka can. So I think that she realizes that she's not the master that he needs on top of believing that he doesn't need to learn the force because he's already gone down this path. So I don't think that they would be a good match because of that. I I disagree. I disagree because Ahsoka saw the worst in the Jedi council and she rejected the Jedi council and chose to be, but she also herself. still sticks to those ways um, by saying I, that he has emotion and attachment and he's not trainable. She's sticking to what the council has. Yeah, trained but her that but that's her that's believe. her that's her fear due to the loss of Anakin and what what eventually True. turned him. I mean, you're you're right in a way that I don't think that she has the facility to break through that, but. I don't. I do believe that she can absolutely make a connection and make a good master for for a young, force sensitive. You know, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, perhaps not not Grogu because of what it's been through. I think. I think that that's. I guess more my opinion. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe not a, a good match just with what Grogu went through. But to to say that she couldn't connect, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. But yeah, I mean, maybe not the best match, for sure. And we do have a, I guess we'll pop to it just because we're already in this. We do have a <laughs> a way <laughs> to uh, determine a proper master, I guess. You know this you know, thing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, pro- probably my least favorite. Of the episode, not that there's a bad part of the episode, not complaining at all. Let's see, what was that planet called? Tight Tithus or uh, uh, yeah, Tython? Sure. Maybe. <laughs> no, not Planet Python. Fitness. Sounds better. <laughs> my my uh, <laughs> my my autocorrect. Planet Fitness? No, no, I'm 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 pretty I'm pretty cool. Uh, I believe it's Tython, and which they categorize as a deep core world. This is in a different language. Why are why does this keep doing this? I don't want oh the, the, I don't want whatever language you're putting this in. Thank you very much. Um, not a ton about it. Uh, shrouded in myth. Um, let's see. Location uh, there, it potentially the location of the Jedi Order's first temple. So, I don't know. Very, very potentially, very strong with the Force. Uh, potentially first ish Jedi temple. A lot of myth. I don't, I don't know. Um, A little bit of lore here. I'm not quite sure if this is... I th- No, this says this is on the canon. So we've got... During the Galactic Civil War, in her efforts to save her loved ones who are located at the Rebel Alliance's headquarters on Hoth... Oh, oh no. Uh, Dr. Afra 
<laughs> brought, oh Darth, brought Darth Vader and his Galactic Empire forces to Tython, distracting them from discovering the location of the Rebel base. Aphra took Vader to uh, Moratorium of Frozen Tears. Uh, okay, where the Empire was ambushed. Years after the fall of the Galactic Empire. Okay, yeah, so this is where they finally tag on about, you know, Ahsoka telling him to go there. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, potentially uh, Jedi Temple. So we're, we're, yeah. set, we're, setting, we're setting baby, well, hey, Grogu, uh, Grogu down, and, uh, you know, maybe someone in the forest will come and check it out. It's like, oh, I feel a, I feel a disturbance in the force. There's someone looking for a master. Cal Kestis away. I was just. Uh, he'd be a little older, but that'd be kind of <laughs> cool in a way. Well, I mean, it, honestly, it, it did make me think who would be available at this time. Let's talk do about that. It. Yeah, I mean, yeah. who who are the Jedi that we know Who's about alive, that are around? You know? So Cal Kestis, obviously, game. Um, his master, Luke. which I'm sorry, I completely forget her name. Well, yes. it's not his master, but yeah. she she was a former former Jedi Knight, and I'm sorry, I forget right. her name. That's my bad. But Luke, she is she is cut off for, cut off from the Force, though. Is she? Well, she she cut or her, she, she just kind suppressed of her. her. Yeah, she you know she, because of all the things that happened with her, you know she she kind of renounced the Jedi sort of faith but we've got luke we've got leia um ezra bridger oh you you, i can't believe you thought of him well that's a little obscure but sure no it's totally not (laughs) um and you know i'm sure that there are some others we could we could kind of go on but i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and say this well, do you want to just let's just drop the sort of big ish reveal from the very end here, and we'll we'll talk more about the actual episode. The one that gave me a heart attack. <laughs> uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn, just the buddy. Wild one. Grand Admiral yeah, yeah. Thrawn, Mithron Yorodo. Um, no, 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 no. You're saying it wrong. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so the, the the whole point is we we have Ahsoka continue her assault. Mando helps. Um, Really great, you know, combat fighting in the streets. Uh, Soka's taking Haunting out guards. Scenes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mando, uh, so Western, we have the face-off between uh, Mando and Lang. Uh, Lang goes to put his saber down, or his saber, his weapon down, <laughs> goes to draw from one on his back. Mando shoots him Smiles down. Smiles like an idiot in the process. Yeah. Giving away his intentions. It was it was, uh, it was was interesting because now that I know that he was in Tombstone, I think back to... <laughs> Makes more sense, doesn't it? Yeah, to the showdown <laughs> with, with Val Kilmer as Doc Holliday. I'll be a Huckleberry. And, you know, just that whole, uh, that whole thing. You said we'd play for blood. I was uh-huh. just fooling. I wasn't. <laughs> so that whole thing was, uh, you know, kind of honestly a bit fairly reminiscent of Tombstone too. that final showdown. Yeah. Um, and then we get a cool little, uh, probably one of Mando's best shots on the uh, droid that goes after him yeah. afterwards. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> it, uh, and I, I also have to say this. I even think his using of his blaster in this seemed different. Like it seemed way more. Crisp. I have noticed that through the entire show that blaster combat changes from, you know, director to director. Well, I, I really. think Filoni really did want to make this more Western, but he was literally like yeah. whipping that around on on yeah. spot firing. It, it it did look it looked more gunfighter ish, and they are using those dang spurs. Why would he have <laughs> spurs? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why would anyone in this universe have spurs? They are not riding horses. Maybe maybe it's an extra pedal on the speeder bikes that you can only reach if you have a spur. <laughs> that, it, no, it doesn't make any sense to me. So It's for the Tauntauns, man. Yeah, whatever. That's what they all say. <laughs> for the Tauntauns. Um, I, I guess before we continue to talk about Thrawn, we have to talk about the, the battle between Ahsoka and our Magistrate. Very well choreographed. I like the yes. movement of the spear fighting and against like the the dual sword, the dual sword or sabers. Um, I thought that that was really really cool. Uh, we get the the shots between 
uh, Ahsoka and the Magistrate fighting, and then the face-off between Mandalorian and Lang. And you hear them in the background, like the clanging yeah. and grunts and everything. It's like, you know, Lang's telling us, like, you know, who, maybe your side will win. Who he thinks going to yeah. win. Yeah, it was, it was kind of neat. <laughs> Looks I actually like you won. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ahsoka does eventually best the magistrate, but magistrate gives her a workout. You know, she, she mm-hmm. dislodges one of her sabers, but Ahsoka That's is, an aw- makes her do a awesome little front flip there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was pretty cool. That was cool. cool. <laughs> it, was, it was acrobatic. Um, yeah. but yeah, we, we, we finally get the, you know, you're defeated. Tell me where, you know, grand Admiral. Your master. Th- yeah. Your, your master. master, grand Admiral <laughs> Thrawn. Thrawn, man. Um, there are a couple things I want to talk about about Thrawn, but let's go ahead with some of the obvious. Now, when we last left Ahsoka in Rebels, she and Sabine were going off to find Ezra. Now, in finding Ezra, you would also find Thrawn because they were taken away at the same time. Sabine is not with Ahsoka right now. So my my brain says there are only a couple things that could have happened. One, they found them. Mm-hmm. Or two, Sabine gave up. Or is dead. I don't think they would have killed her. But yeah, I mean, could be. Could be. But giving up sort of I don't think they would weird. do an off-screen death for her, though. That would be very odd. No. Very odd. So... My theory is this, and and I'm sure you have your own thoughts too, but my theory is this. I think that they found Thrawn and Ezra. I think Ezra is with Sabine. And I think that they are writing Thrawn to be a bad guy, despite the fact that that will probably P.O. Timothy Zahn like nuts. Because the way yeah, Timothy's on writes being Thrawn, written as a bad guy. <laughs> no, th- th- there, there's a lot of sympathetic uh, qualities, and he's like he's not a bad guy with the chiss, but he is attempting to use the Empire to help his people. Uh, Emphasis on use, not side with and agree with right. their moral stance. So it'll be interesting to see how the show writes Thrawn. Is is Thrawn really? a bad guy or is Gideon a bad guy and Thrawn's like using him? Is there some program? I I don't know that there's, there's gotta be something more because if you write Thrawn, if you write Thrawn as a villain, that's going to really interfere with the books that you have already put out that are canon. And then conversely, and the books that are coming out now too, because why would you have such a big backstory on the villain? True. I mean, yes, Star Wars done it before, but, other than Darth Vader, we really don't dive into the baddies all that much. We don't get that with Palpatine. We don't get that with Maul. We don't True. get it with anyone else. So why would we do that with Thrawn? But then tacking on to that, there are a lot of people that saw Thrawn as like the big bad guy in Rebels. And although that is technically true, there were definitely times when he showed the more book-like side, like with, um, oh, what was that? like totem thing uh, that Hera was trying to recapture from her home when they went back uh, to her home planet. And Thrawn was like, you know, I'll keep this in a place of honor and everything. So he wasn't like executing the masses, but like he clearly was working for the empire. And we saw that in the Thrawn books as well. So it's, it's not like it's unheard of, but there is a much more sympathetic view being put on in the books. And if you're going to make him some big bad villain, I don't necessarily know if that's the right way to go about it. I'm not sure. But I well, I think I, if we didn't have the Thrawn books we have now, I would be okay with that. But again, I don't really see Thrawn as Ezra's enemy so much as they happen to be on opposite sides. Right. And there's sure. really no way around that. Yeah. You know, there's no reason they can't eventually reconcile. So I don't like the idea of him becoming the bad guy, but Ahsoka has no reason not to look at him as the bad guy. So it also <laughs> opens up potential for some type of character development there where they realize they're not really on opposite sides anymore now that the Empire has been yeah. taken down. But here's the other it's, thing, it, too. It'll be interesting because Thrawn won't really have any reason to stick with the Empire now. 
it won't benefit his people. Well, ho- hold on. Let, let me let me put this out here because it, I think it's important. Does Thrawn know about the First Order? Does Thrawn know about the Emperor? Because the thing is, is if he does, the Republic is weak. And I'm sorry, but the Republic is... It, 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 we saw this in Aftermath. We've seen it time and time again. Even in this show, like they can't... They can't dispense their justice throughout the entire universe. They just can't do it. They're not big enough, and they're they're not. And they wouldn't be able to stand enough. with the chest against an enemy. That's either. my issue because Thrawn's motivation has always been his own people. This galaxy doesn't matter to the chess. Not really. Good, bad, yeah. and different. He is trying to make sure that his home is preserved from whatever enemy that they're fighting that we haven't been cleared of yet. So my thought process is, does he know about the Emperor and the First Order? Because that would seem like a much more powerful ally than the Republic is. Now, if the Republic were the Jedi and all that stuff, I think it would have been different, but it's not. It's not that anymore. So for me, I start to wonder if maybe he already knows, and he's trying to throw his hat in to like make that big again so that he can take it home with him or have it help his home. It's a bit naive because it's really not a great plan, but you know the Chiss view strength differently. Correct, and it brings up a lot of questions now. <laughs> Are we going to see Thrawn in Mando, or is this a really big setup for an Ahsoka series? Is this a continuation of Rebels? Right, and it also goes back to if we've already found Ezra and Sabine is with him. Are we going to then see, because there's been talk of Sabine being in this show. Right. Do we have, you know, I always thought it was kind of weird. We've had all of these characters revealed so early on. We're going to have Ahsoka. We're going to have Boba Fett. We're going to have Sabine. We're going to have all these different people. And it just seemed like, you know, we're not saving any big reveals. We already have our bad guy in Gideon. I don't think we're going to have Thrawn as the bad guy now. So what does that leave for a big reveal? Oh, I it think... just feels like we could be setting up for Ezra Bridger being the one to, you know, eat the call for baby Yoda. If we go to this temple and Sabine would probably be with him. So if, if someone answers the call from the temple, I feel like it would be Ezra. Um, but if no one does, then I think that Mando maybe just says, okay, well, you're just going to have to come with me and do my thing. You're a Mandalorian now. You're not going to be a Jedi. <laughs> no. But my thing is, is that with Thrawn, I believe he will show up probably at the end of the season. Um, and I think we're going to set up some, for, I would assume, some pretty big things in season three. Um, because I think I think what we're going to get is I think we'll get the confrontation – with Mando and Gideon, and I do think it will be the Mandalorian now because he has the spear. So I think that we'll have that confrontation, <clears throat> and then maybe Mando bests him and he says, you know, I'm not even, you know, the, the, the this isn't even our final form. And he's like, where's your master? Where, where is he? Where's the arm? You know, and like his... his so do we man. kill... Do we kill Gideon and replace him with Thrawn? Uh, you know, Is that I don't what know. We're leaning towards. I don't know. I'm not sure. If this were one of the cartoons, I would say no. But if this were, you know, being that this is live action, I, I really, I, I think, I think Gideon will continue to be around. I think that the the actor is that good, and I honestly think there's been a little bit of talk of him being in season three, uh, anyway. But I think we'll get. I think we'll get a showdown. I don't know. I still. I still have a hard time thinking that the Mandalorian is going to best Gideon. Maybe. Maybe there are properties of the dark saber that can cut through Beskar because it was a Mandalorian's weapon. It wasn't a, just True. a Jedi's weapon. It was. It was a Mandalorian's weapon. So maybe Gideon bests Mando. I still think that that's a possibility, and I feel like he'd be rescued by like Bo Katan or something like that. Another thing too is I think we're going to get an unmasking of of Din Djarin. I think I think we're going to get the ma- unmasking um, 
because I, I really, I, I really don't think that the whole cult thing is going to sit well with people forever. So I think we're going to get his, we're going to get his dishelming at some point and that'll be something new that we'll have to deal with. You know, I've thought more about the dark saber lately and you know, the implications of it. Yes. It's a, weapon used by the Mandalorian and all that, but the, the <laughs> lore of it, the whole point of it. And the Jedi who created that also wanted to, you know, bridge the gap between his people, the Jedi and the Mandalorians. And I just kind of wonder if there's going to be some kind of... I just... It would be hard to break into that lore. But, you know, it, it'd be ironic if it ends up going to Baby Yoda down the line or. I mean, do you think there's a chance that the Mandalorian would end up wielding it? Mm, I know we've. No, I mean, I, I don't particularly uh, I don't particularly care about that. Honestly, I don't I don't think that that's something that's that's necessary. Um, I still kind of think it is, <clears throat> I, we need to know how it got out of Bo-Katan's hands. I think. Mm-hmm. I agree I, there. I think, I, yeah, I think we need to, I think we need to figure that out first. Um, I don't know, man. I, I'm I'm not sure. It's I'm not sure, man. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, I I just I I, mm, I I don't I don't think I want speculate Din, on it. Now. I just <laughs> I just don't think I want Din Djarin to be like the leader of the Mandalorians. Like I just don't see him like that for some reason. I still see Bo Katan as the person. Well, personally, I, I I actually see Sabine. She's earned it. I see Sabine a little bit more, but I think I think that's just because I you know we spent so much time with Sabine in Rebels, and she was the one who yeah. kind of brought it back into the fold and trained with it, and then eventually gave it to to Bo. So I think if not Sabine, then it it has to be Bo. Uh, I I don't know. Din Djarin's honorable. I think he's a good representation of, you know, what Mandalorian should be, aside from the whole always keep your helmet on thing. Mm-hmm. But uh, th- there's just a lot of unanswered questions. There, it's really hard to, it's really hard for me to weave the fabric at this point because we're we're, we're weaving in a lot from lore and canon and TV shows and books into a show, <coughs> excuse me, that is supposed to be about the Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know how, how, I don't know how deep they're willing to go. If this were all written by Dave Filoni, then okay, but it's not, they all. could get pretty far into the rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> um, it really just depends on how many seasons we're going to get, I think. Because I don't think Filoni's the type that would start all these arcs and then let them fizzle out if he knows, yeah. well, I've got a season left. Probably won't get more than that. I'm not going to bother adding these characters. How many How many seasons do you think we're going to get? I know we've asked this before, but how many seasons do you think? I think at least four. <laughs> See, I, I think, I, I think no, we're going to get five. Six. I think we're going to get at least five. But yeah, I don't think we're going to get more than that either. I think you could. Yeah, I think anything past six would probably. This is our first dive into this type of media for Star Wars. I don't want it to become, you know, kind of go back to Breaking Bad. You know, that show ended when it needed to. It sure. didn't just keep hanging on because of the popularity of it. I feel like they should do the same with this. You know, I don't want this to become a 12 season show where they lose their way and they're just kind of hanging on for profit. Yeah. Well, an- another thing that was brought up by uh, both Chase and Eric over at uh, These Are the Voyages podcast 
the sentiment was every episode is essentially the same structure. It's a fetch quest. You go here, you do this thing, you help out, and then you leave and no character ever comes with you. And then you go to the next place and you fetch quest and then you do all this stuff. So I, I Which I makes do, it very difficult to have more than five seasons, I believe. Yeah. Because we're not having enough development of multiple characters for us to really care. Mando's yep. it, you know? Yep. It, it is it's difficult. I think it is very difficult. So we'll we'll see. We'll see how it all goes, but um, uh, what else? What else do we want to talk about uh, spawning from the episode? We, I think we've basically gotten through everything. Uh, well, I mean, the very end, Ahsoka, again, you know, can't train, go to this place, do your thing. And um, I did think it was really much- cute when Mando was, like, going to get maybe uh, Grogu. Um and like he was in his little hammock and then they just sort of sat there for a little while. I thought that was very, yeah, the whole very cool. Time to say goodbye thing. Yeah. yeah. And then Ahsoka points out, it's like, you're a, you're like a father to him. And yeah. you know, that was, that was kind of neat. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. The, d- the developments, uh, it, it's perfect. I believe the way they've developed their relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, very happy with how they did that. And it, it was definitely an emotional moment because uh, honestly, for a split second, I actually contemplated the the idea of him giving her, you know, Grogu and that being it. Yeah. Now, there was potential there for that. So uh, <laughs> I like how much they've made me care about that relationship. I'm very invested in it. So, right. So that, <laughs> the only annoying thing in a way is, you know, you set us up for this next quest where we're still trying to find another Jedi for him. But I'm at that point where I'm like, no, I don't want that to happen. <laughs> it's a cool concept, but I don't want it to happen. Yeah. Yep. So I don't know. Like you said, it's just kind of cool to think of him getting his own little set of Mandalorian armor and, you know. His first words are, this is the way. <laughs> oh, <God. sighs> yeah, they could just not do that. <clears throat> Probably be a good idea. What do you think Baby Yoda's first words would be if he actually says anything by the end of this series? Food. <laughs> yeah, probably. Hungry. Hungry I am. <laughs> you know, there's, there's somebody out there that put out a meme. It's like, well... Yeah, I mean, it's not going to understand what you're saying. You're not speaking to it the right way. You have to speak to it like Yoda. (laughs) God. That'd be funny to find out that was just a Yoda thing and the rest of the species don't talk like that. Yeah. We've never never heard Yaddle speak, so. (laughs) So, you know what might be interesting sometime? Because I I, I just. What if if Yaddle's the one that answers the call? I didn't even think about that. If she's still alive. I don't think she's still alive. No, I mean, that'd be interesting, not. but I don't think I don't think we'll see that. I yeah. mean, back with the timeline, Yoda might still be kicking it. He might be alive. No, he's he's dead. This is all this is all post. Um, oh, post well, what am I thinking? Fall of the sure. Empire. That's way too far. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're he's, Sorry, he's gone. Like I said, fart. Force Ghost. Brain force fart, ghost. I'm tired. Yeah, no, no, you're fine. Force <laughs> Ghost. He, he's maybe. the call. It's a Force Ghost. Yeah. yeah. Something interesting that we might look at before the next episode. There is a pretty extensive page on on Tython in the Legends category. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking like thirty to forty thousand BBY, like okay. a long time ago. Yeah. So maybe this is something we might both want to look at. Vaguely, I mean, it, it's not necessarily going to do much for our story now, but it might be interesting to look through and see if there's anything we can tie in to lore. Because it's made a few appearances. It's uh, mainly uh, books, games, what kind of... What have we seen it in? Uh, 
Yeah, that's kind of what I'm going through now. So it would that was be, that wouldn't be Kotor error, would it? Old Republic, the Old Republic game. So yeah, I mean it's mentioned in some games, Star Wars: The Old Republic. Um, it mentions. Oh, here's one I didn't I didn't get to read this one because it, God, this was back in the old old days for another podcast. But uh, we started read. I think I own this book. Fatal Alliance. Uh, Maybe not. It was on the reading list. No, I do. It's right there. Did we read that? I do believe I saw that the other day. I think I saw that the other day at the half price store. I'd have to pick that up now. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't. I think that this one was. Is it referenced in the book, or is it a focal point in the book? I don't know. I don't remember the book. I don't even. I. I don't know if we read this book or not because we were going down in several series in the old Republic. And I don't know if, um, if we actually got through this one or if I bought it and this was the next one up. So Mm. it's in a lot, uh, a lot of old Republic stuff. Um, Darth Bane rule of two, uh, Darth Bane, a couple of Darth Bane dynasty of evil. Bane's awesome. He's cool. Mm-hmm. Coruscant Knights. I don't know what, what is that. <laughs> oh my gosh, Coruscant Knights. That's interesting. It's like a. It's it like Jedi Knights or Knights. I feel like that's like a. What was the GTA with the in the eighties? Vice oh, City. Um, yeah, Vice City. You know, feel like it's like neon and like Van Halen. Um, let's get some death sticks, guys. Come on, let's sticks. go. <laughs> Dawn of the Jedi into the void. A lot of books. So I don't know, man. I mean, it might be something. I, I know when she said that planet, I was like, gosh, I, I, it, I know I've heard it. So it must have been the mention in, Anni- in Annihilation. I don't remember if I read. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe some literature. We, we, we should probably look at at least the you know the wiki page on on the planet and go through it a little bit before the um the next episode so we can i don't know the jedi you know we we we've, we've got to we've got to get more acquainted mm-hmm. so anyway anything else we want to talk about uh, about the episode i think we're good okay well let's go on to ratings and what would you rate this uh, particular episode uh usually do at 10 correct yep I think nine, nine. Okay. So this is, <laughs> I said this exact thing last week too. This is the best episode of the Mandalorian to this point. <laughs> well, it, that's fitting because I think we went with eight and a half on the last one. Yeah. So there you Th- go. <laughs> this is the best episode of the Mandalorian to this point. Um, I do not yeah, I see flaws in it. Like I've watched it multiple times. And to be honest, Sometimes I don't do that. Sometimes I'll watch it twice and then that's it. And then, you know, like a months later, I'll do a rewatch. This one is one that I've watched several times. I've really enjoyed it. And so that's, that is why I have to go, I have to go high because listen, I don't think that this episode could have been any better than the way it was thrown down. I really don't. I, I don't, agree. I don't see how there, you know, you could make it any better. It was a great snapshot. You got Ahsoka. You got a crazy mention of Thrawn, which tickles. Very, very well done, Ahsoka, at that. Yeah, tickles me pink because I, I do enjoy the Thrawn books, the Mary Sue that he is, and I really like Chaos Rising. I thought that was a great book. Um, so for me, <clears throat> because I don't think that anything is ever a 10. I think it, it, the pursuit of, of perfection is the pursuit of insanity. Nothing is ever perfect. That is impossible. So because I can't do a 10 just based off of my own logic, I am going to put this at a 9.8. Wow. It is okay. the best episode of The Mandalorian to this point. And I have to say to I this point that. because I also said that for the last episode, which I geeked <laughs> out over a lot. <laughs> 
Hey, if we can keep this trend going and we get another one after this, I'm okay with that. It's Who the knows? best we might episode. We're in the next episode. I, I should, hey guys, guess what? It's the best episode again. I should probably revise that 9.8 then, and you, you know what? I would say you might want to dial that back a little bit so you can keep going up. No, <laughs> you might I, trap yourself. In all seriousness, I, I 9.5 I think is is more than fair. I'm gonna. I, I will revise. I will say 9.5. I I don't like to paint myself into a corner. 9.5 though, I think for me is uh, is absolutely accurate. It, it it is the best episode to this point. So, Agree. well, folks, uh, hopefully you enjoyed. If you would like to, I don't know, give us your opinions on the episode, tell us what you thought, you can head on over to Facebook, let us know there. You can send us an email to tcplanpodcast at gmail.com. You can hit us up on Twitter, make sure to follow us there at tcplanpodcast. And uh, yeah, looking forward to next week. I have Thursday and Friday off. <laughs> so, oh, lucky you. <laughs> had to burn vacation time, so I'll be uh, nerding out then. Uh, yeah. But yeah, thank you guys very much for listening, and you guys have a great rest of your week.